So a very warm welcome to uh, Bohemia House and I'd particularly like to welcome our honoured guests this evening. We have representatives from uh, uh, the Mayor of, uh, uh, Deputy Mayor of Camden. We've seen guests in including His Excellency the Ambassador from the uh, Slovak uh, Republic. On the guests from the uh, from the uh, the Czech Embassy, and uh, we extend a very warm welcome. So the theme of this evening is really about Adlertag, and it's about Britain not alone. So you have stamps saying Britain alone, and Britain certainly wasn't alone. I think in 1940, there were many air airmen and uh, and women that uh, came from occupied Europe between 1939 and 1945 and uh, they valiantly gave their lives in terms of uh, defeating the, uh, the Nazi menace in Europe. There were also people from uh, the Caribbean, people from Africa, people from India as well as you know, the Canadians and the, the Anzacs. Well today is the 13th of August and it's the 80th anniversary of what the Germans called Adlertag. Some people regard it as the first day of the official Battle of Britain which lasted until October. This was the first major day when the something like 3,000 uh, German aircraft were pitted against the 1,200 aircraft of fighter command. We had other aircraft as well, but the key thing were the, uh, were the fighters. So what we'd like to do today is to express our, uh, our admiration, really, and remember uh, uh, some of the uh, men and women, and you can see them listed on the plaque here, uh, this struck me many years ago when I first came to the uh, Czechoslovak club and it commemorates the four squadrons uh, of the uh, Czechoslovak part of, uh, of the RAF. 310, 311, 312 and 313. And if, so um, I'm going to talk about two particular uh, airmen. I'm going to talk first of all about Otto Schmidt. Well, he was the champion for the RAF in terms of the number of enemy aircraft downed in 1943 and 1944. He uh, was shot down twice. Uh, he was flying Spitfires. He was shot down over uh, German-occupied Netherlands and him and a group of other airmen actually escaped through enemy lines. He went back into the RAF and he was shot down a second time and unfortunately killed with one of his fellow pilots. So that's the, uh, that's the, the first hero and very much celebrated. I think the second hero is really uh, Flight Sergeant uh, Franzik, and I think he's uh, equally valiant, but in a very different way. He flew Hurricanes. Uh, he was an experienced pilot. He fought in uh, Poland and was given uh, awards in Poland, in France as well. And he eventually found his way to Britain in July 1940. And in the short period until October of, uh, of that year, he shot down no less than 17 enemy aircraft. He was a real maverick, he didn't get on with the uh, Czechoslovak uh, authorities, so he decided he was going to join uh, the Polish uh, squadron. He, he was always getting into fights, so the RAF said to him, OK, you can go out on your own. He's been celebrated in, uh, in, in cinema, and in his short life he achieved an, an, an immense amount. One thing, um, he somehow did not mention the end of Sergeant Frantisek, and he had a girlfriend uh, and went to show off. Uh, he wasn't killed in battle, uh, he tripped with his undercarriage over the fence and was killed on the spot, having beforehand shot down 17 enemy planes plus some damaged ones and probable ones or whatever. So that was a girl behind that, you know. <laughs> And by August 1940, a total of 932 Czechoslovak airmen managed to reach Britain, both pilots and ground personnel. And uh, there were still more of them coming. And when the worst came to worst, like the Adler attack was nearing, uh, the British uh, uh, government decided to call in the Poles and the Czechs. Uh, there were 88 Czechoslovak pilots taking part in the Battle of Britain and uh, all in all they shot down 72 uh, uh, certain 16 probables and 14 damaged during the Battle of Britain and uh, overall uh, uh, during the Second World War it was about 204 destroyed, 81 probable and 131 uh, damaged Luftwaffe planes, plus six destroyed V-1s, 
uh, and the 311 bomber squadron dropped over 94,000 bombs and later with the coastal command it attacked over 70 submarines and surface ships. Talk about a lot about, um, about uh, heroism, uh, but uh, it's important I think to recognise the work that civilians did, particularly in the London Borough of Camden, and particularly women. And there were lots of uh, aircraft uh, uh, component factories in this particular area. Amongst them my grandmother, who uh, worked on uh, at, uh, Smith Industries up in Cricklewood, which was a big manufacturer. It is good to reflect in silence about our countrymen who fled their occupied country but to continue fight for freedom. Council so Francis, uh, dear colleagues from Czech Embassy, uh, dear friends, uh, first of all I would like to thank uh, the organizers for organizing this, uh, this nice event, uh, this big anniversary despite of uh, this uh, coronavirus restrictions but in a very nicely uh, refurbished uh, national uh, house here in West Hempstead, not far away from, from uh, residences of me and of the Czech ambassador in, in Hempstead, so uh, we are locals uh, here as well. Uh, this, when, you, uh, when you are discovering the individual uh, uh, fates of, this, of these people, you, you are fascinated by, by every, uh, every story of this, of this uh, really uh, young and strong and, and brave, uh, mainly men, but not only, also, also, also women. So it's uh, really necessary to remind all the time and to remind it to younger generation uh, how important uh, the fight, uh, fight was and uh, how we had to uh, keep this, uh, this memory uh, alive. This Saturday uh, I'm going with my Czech colleague uh, Ambassador Sechka to Duxford uh, where in the uh, Imperial War Museum will be unveiled uh, the, the uh, Spitfire of uh, Josef Frantisek nation uh, today. <laughs> Also mentioned, uh, they are going uh, together with our ambassador to, to visit uh, uh, the graves of the soldiers, and uh, the, our, the, our, the our ambassador decided to visit each grave of the soldiers buried on the British soil, and we could also find uh, that uh, there were many many casualties, and uh, because it was a war time. Uh, there were many, many soldiers who were just not able to cope with the reality and committed suicide or there were many, many uh, mental disorders and so on. So there were heroes, there were all other ordinary people. So the basic conclusion, the war is bad. Uh, the consequences of the war are even worse, especially for the country like the Czechoslovakia, who depended on the great powers. Uh, and after the uh, war, we lost our political uh, f uh, independence and the people were impo impoverished and so on. So you can see the consequences for the dozen and dozen years. So I would like to maybe later on propose a toast to the, all the heroes who came here as a young man uh, who gathered here in a public place. Uh, to feel their, 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 their happiness for, for a moment because they didn't know if the next day they would be dead or not. So what I'm going to talk about is the London connection and um, London has been very important for the history of Czechs and Slovaks for a very long time. I'm going to start the story about 1900. Sometime in the early 1900s, and I'm not sure exactly the date, but there was a man, uh, a Czech man, John Sikora, and his house 
uh, so 26 Gloucester Avenue near Regent's Park, became known as the Czech Colony Club. And a number of uh, Czechs used to live there, and it ran a restaurant, and it had like a library where people would come along. When the First World War started, the men of the Sokol unit volunteered for the British Army, and they were rejected because they were Austrian citizens. And so they were considered enemies, even though they wanted to fight with the British. So a number of them went over to France and joined the French Foreign Legion, where they really didn't care who you were or where you came from. <laughs> in April 1915, Tomasz Masaryk arrived in London with his daughter Olga. And it's from this point that we start to talk about not the London Czech Committee and the Czech Club, but we start to talk about the London Czechoslovak Committee and the Czechoslovak Club, because Tomasz Masaryk had adopted the, the Slovaks into the cause. And so from this point, we talk about um, Czechoslovak rather than Czech. So he first he arrived in London and tried, had to find somewhere to stay. And he first lived in an attic in a lodging house in Holford Road. In autumn 1916, he was then able to move to 21 Platts Lane, West Hampstead. He was working with another man called Edward Benesch, who'd been a student, who was in Paris. Between them, they had this plan that they were going to petition the governments of the Allies to have the independence of Czechoslovakia as one of the war aims. And so this was their grand plan. It might not have worked, but by getting Czechoslovaks to fight with the Allies instead of the Austrians, um, they then earned themselves a place as one of the Allied nations. They, they ran a very successful public relations campaign by every means possible to persuade the British public to support the Czechoslovaks. And, um, and of course, we know that at the end of the war, um, their plan worked. And I would like to say it's probably one of the most successful public relations campaigns in history. In the fact, there's not many public relations campaigns that have resulted in the creation of a non-existent country, in a sense. Masaryk used to walk on Hampstead Heath in the afternoons to think, and every morning he went over to the Czechoslovak club, and it's there that he wrote the first draft of the constitution of Czechoslovakia. There were so many Czechoslovaks in the British army that there was a separate branch of the British Legion, there was a Czechoslovak branch of the British Legion that was formed. And after Czechoslovakia was created, and they went back, they used to meet at the British Embassy in Prague. So Thomas Masaryk became president of Czechoslovakia and um, the dream of Czechoslovakia was formed. Of course, that dream only really lasted for about 20 years, as we know. And the Munich Agreement came along and Benesch was, in the words of Jan Masaryk, he had the choice of being murdered or committing suicide. You know, do we agree with this and be invaded, or do we not agree with it and get invaded? So he resigned, fell into depression, and was brought to Putney. And he lived in Putney. And um, then the Blitz came, and Putney was bombed. A bomb fell there, and his friends moved him out with the help of the Rothschilds to a house at Aston Abbott's near Aylesbury. And I've written a book about that over there called The Czech Connection. So during the war, the, the Czechoslovak Colony Club moved from 26 Gloucester Avenue to one to two Bedford Place, Hoban. And it was there for a few years. And then Benesch bought this place, or helped buy this place, and it moved here to 74 West End Lane. And of course it's here that we've got this memorial. I'd like to say that, that the history of Czechoslovakia and London is heavily intertwined.